like big cuts, and I cannot lie, especially brisket. Really love to barbecue it. Don't have a lot of luck with braising it, and that's because it always turns out dry and tough. And that's inexplicable because it's been braising in liquid for hours. So Julia's here and she's gonna show me what I'm doing wrong. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Where did I go wrong? Actually, for years, all briskets have been dry. We've just gotten used to it. But today we're gonna solve the problem once and for all. All right. And we're gonna start with buying the right cut. So here is a whole brisket and here is one that is cut into two pieces. So this is usually what you find at the store, but this is to show you what it looks like when it's put together. Gotcha. So this side is obviously nice and even cut. This is called the flat cut. This is called the point cut. And you can see the point cut actually has some lovely intramuscular fat, sure does. which means it's well marbled, but it's a wonky cut. It's thin on this side, thick on this side, hard to braise evenly. So sure we're going is. with the flat cut. All right. So this is a four to five pound piece of meat. And you can see it has a really nice mm -hmm. fat cap on the top. We're going to keep that fat cap but we're gonna trim it back to just a quarter of an inch. And this actually looks pretty good. You don't wanna bite into a big piece of fat, but you definitely wanna have it there to provide moisture during the cooking time. Actually, that looks pretty good. Mm -hmm. Right off the bat, I'm gonna do something unusual. I'm gonna cut this down into two pieces because they'll cook more evenly and they'll cook a little bit more quickly. So I'm cutting it right down the middle. That's with the grain. So there we have nice two pieces. And we're gonna salt the meat, which is something we do a lot because salting changes the protein structure so that it's actually able to hold on more moisture while it cooks. So I'm gonna take a skewer. I'm gonna poke each of these 20 times all the way through. That's gonna give the salt something to penetrate. And 20. All right, so 20 on each side. Now we're gonna sprinkle some salt all over the meat. We're gonna salt it overnight. And this is five teaspoons of kosher salt. And any salt that hits the board, I really just kind of wipe the meat all over the board to make sure all that salt gets on the meat. The meat is nicely poked and salted. Now I'm gonna wrap each piece in plastic wrap and put them in the refrigerator for at least 16 hours. You really have to have enough time for that salt to do its job. But you can leave it in there for up to 48 hours. All right, so the meat is perfectly salted and it's time to get cooking. Okay, good. But because of the size of the meat and the fact that we like the surface area for sauce reduction, we're just gonna use a roasting pan. It makes sense, otherwise you try to shove it in a Dutch oven, it's curling up the sides. Mm -hmm. That's exactly it. So in here, I have two tablespoons of vegetable oil and I'm heating it up over medium heat. You can see it's just starting to shimmer. So I'm gonna add two chopped onions. We're just gonna saute them till they're nice and soft. And to help that along, I'm gonna add a special ingredient, a little baking soda. This is a quarter teaspoon of baking soda. It's gonna help speed up the softening of the onions. It's gonna sit here and cook these again for about five minutes. All right, so those onions are looking pretty good. Something happened. <laughs> They're yellow. They're yellow, that's the baking soda. It helps browning, of course, and it helps alter the color of the onions. Mm. To this, I'm gonna add six cloves of minced garlic. I'm just gonna give that about 30 seconds to saute. Now, I'm gonna add some new flavors. Here I have anchovies. This is four minced and rinsed anchovies. Now, it's not gonna add an anchovy flavor, as you all know, but it is gonna add a nice hearty background to the sauce. Moving on, I'm gonna add a tablespoon of tomato paste. This is a tablespoon of cumin, one and a half teaspoons of cardamom, and these warm spices are really delicious in the sauce. Half a teaspoon of black pepper, and just a little bit of cayenne, eighth of a teaspoon, just a little kick. You just wanna give those spices just about 30 seconds to a minute or so to really bloom their flavor. All right, next up, flour. Now this is gonna help thicken the sauce. This is a quarter cup of all-purpose flour. And as it goes into the pan, it's gonna mix with some of the fat that's left over in the pan and make a roux. So we're gonna cook this for about two minutes or so until it has changed color and there's no floury pockets left behind. You can see that is a nice sticky roux. And now goes the liquid and this pomegranate juice. Oh, I thought it was red wine. I know, no, it's very unusual, but the flavor is fruity and a little acidic, and it pairs so well with that rich cut of beef. And again, it's just another modern twist on the classic. All right, I'm also gonna add some chicken broth, and this is one and a half cups of chicken broth. I'm gonna add three bay leaves. I'm just making sure I got all the browned bits scraped up and there's no more clumps of flour left behind. Looking good to me. 
Last but definitely not least, I'm gonna add some gelatin. Hmm. So this is two tablespoons of powdered gelatin. And you know, the one thing we found about brisket is it contains a ton of gelatin. But unlike other cuts where the gelatin melts and leaches into the sauce, that doesn't happen with the brisket. The gelatin just softens. It doesn't get into the sauce and help it thicken. So adding a little gelatin just gives it a boost. We're just gonna bring this up to a simmer before we add the beef. So for most braises, we braise at a temperature between 300 and 325. But when you do that with brisket, it takes about five hours, and the meat comes out incredibly dry, as you well know. That's what happens to me. So then we tried using a lower temperature, around 250, and it never got tender. And actually, gelatin, as you know, melts at 180 degrees, but in a 250 oven, it never got above 165. So it was super chewy, but it was moist. Yeah. <laughs> so what we're gonna do is we're gonna mix those two methods. We're gonna start in a 325 degree oven. That's gonna get the meat and jump started up to that melting temperature of 180. And then we're gonna turn the oven down so it has a nice, slow, easy finish so the meat doesn't dry out. So this is at a nice boil. Time to add our beef. As with any braise, the sauce only comes up about halfway in the meat and that is perfect. So I'm gonna turn this off. Obviously, there's no lid for roasting pan, so we're just gonna use a piece of foil. Get it as tight as you can, because you wanna trap all that moisture inside. All right, that looks pretty good. So again, 325 for the first hour and a half, and I'm gonna turn the oven down to 250, and it goes for two to two and a half hours after that. Well, since brisket takes a long time for it to turn tender, we thought that cooking it in a low oven the whole time would be a perfect plan. Turns out, physics had another idea for us. In a 250 degree oven, the meat's temperature rises to about 165 degrees and just stays there. Moisture on the meat is turning into steam and that transformation requires energy. The evaporating water uses almost all the heat the oven is putting out. Raising the oven temperature to 325 degrees provides enough heat to both evaporate the water on the brisket surface and to get into the meat itself. So in order to get the brisket to the temperature we wanted, we used a hotter oven to overcome the evaporative cooling effect. All right, let's take a mm. peek here. Oh, Ooh, they shrunk up quite a bit, huh? They sure did. Let's take a good look and see how tender they are using a dinner fork. If I can pick it up and I can actually braise the meat out of the pan, it's not done yet. So, and those are done. Those are perfectly done. Now I'm gonna take them out of this liquid Cover these with foil so that they stay nice and warm. So let's talk about this sauce. It is a little on the watery side, so we need to reduce it. I'm just gonna give it a quick strain to move any of those bits into a nice wide container. Tap, 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 tap to get it to come through. Ooh, that is some good glossy sauce. I'm gonna let this sit for about 10 minutes, let the fat collect on top, then we're gonna spoon it off and I'm gonna put it back into a 400 degree oven to evaporate. All right, so that's the last of the skimming I need to do. You can see that's quite a bit of fat. That would just make the sauce too greasy. Too greasy. Now I'm just wiping any of the little schmutz out of the bottom of the pan, any of those solids. Pour this back into the roasting pan. So this is gonna take about half an hour or so in the oven. Again, that's a 400 degree oven. I'm gonna go in there every once in a while and give it a good stir. Oh, that has reduced, definitely. Mm. Follow the trail of goodness. <laughs> Look at that. Oh. Now, notice I'm scraping up all this goodness on the side of the pan. Oh yeah. That is serious flavor. So you definitely wanna get as much of that back into the sauce as you can. And actually I'm gonna use the sauce to kind of go up there and scrape that fond back in. Just deglazing it with the actual sauce. That's it. Yep. We're gonna let this sit and we're gonna turn our attention to the meat. It's been resting patiently over here. Now I'm just gonna slice it into thin slices, about a quarter of an inch thick. Notice I'm doing it crosswise. That's gonna help make it seem extra tender. Going right across that grain. That's always a good idea with any cut of meat, but especially cuts of meat that have a very, very visible grain. It just shortens the strands of the meat to make it feel even more tender. That looks plenty tender on its own. I'm just gonna use the handy slicing knife to help me get the meat right onto a nice platter. Now we're gonna take this gorgeous oh. sauce. We're just gonna pour yes. it down. That sauce is just gorgeous, isn't it? It is beautiful and it's mm. thick enough that it's really clinging to the meat. You're not mm. ending up with brisket soup there. So I'm just gonna <laughs> top it with a few more really interesting ingredients that you don't often see with brisket. This is three tablespoons of chopped 
fresh cilantro. Again, goes with those warm spices and that pomegranate juice. Lovely. Last but not least, some pomegranate seeds. Using the other parts. And again, this just helps <laughs> gussy up the meat because when you really look at it, brisket in a brown sauce isn't always the most beautiful. So a little color right. goes a long way. And also, the juice in these fresh seeds will really brighten up that sauce. You a nice big piece. Get a little more of that sauce. Thank oh, yeah. goodness. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I love the richness and the tartness of that sauce. Right? Oh, it's beautiful because it really cuts through. So tender, so juicy. It is perfection. Thank you so much. Well, if you'd like to take this new approach to braised brisket, cut a flat cut brisket in half, poke with a paring knife, season, and refrigerate. Create a sauce with sauteed onions, savory anchovies, tomato paste, and spices. Stir in flour, then deglaze with broth and pomegranate juice. Braise the brisket in the sauce until tender, reduce the sauce, slice the meat, and serve. So from our test kitchen to your kitchen, an updated, improved, and woken up <laughs> braised brisket. Thanks for watching America's Test Kitchen. What'd you think? Well, leave a comment and let us know which recipes you're excited to make, or you can just say hello. You can find links to today's recipes and reviews in the video description. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you later. I'll see you later.